given that elimination reactions of alkyl halides form alkenes, I think it's prudent at this point to take a moment and talk about the structure, nomenclature, and stability trends of alkenes. We're not going to have too much to say about nomenclature. All I'll say here is that when we name alkenes, the parent chain includes the carbon-carbon double bond and has the suffix ene to note that there is a double bond in the structure, and we usually use a number, a bond locant number, to indicate where that double bond shows up in the carbon chain. And we number to give the double bond uh, the smallest number possible, using a single locant number to refer to the smaller number carbon in the bond. So here, for example, we've got 556 five, trimethyl. We've got a methyl here and two here. 2-heptene or hept-2-ene indicating we have a 7-carbon parent chain with a double bond between carbons 2 and 3. Now, a more important naming convention that is used more frequently and that is important because it relates to the stability of alkenes is based on the number of substituents linked to the doubly bonded carbons. Alkenes are often classified in this way. We talk about ethylene as completely unsubstituted, kind of the parent alkene in this sense. We can talk about monosubstituted alkenes with one R group linked to the carbons of the double bond, disubstituted alkenes, and we can talk about 1,2 disubstituted alkenes like this. We can also talk about 1,1 one, one disubstituted alkenes like this, which do have some different properties from the 1,2 disubstituted alkenes. We can talk about tri-substituted alkenes with three R groups linked to the carbons of the uh, alkene, the doubly bonded carbons, and tetra-substituted alkenes, which have four R groups linked to the carbons involved in the double bond. So again, this classification scheme is quite important because it relates to alkene stability, and we're going to see that in the ensuing slides in this video. When it comes to the stability trends of alkenes, the first and probably most important that we should talk about is the trans versus cis issue, and the general observation that applies to pretty much every pair of diastereomeric trans and cis alkenes that the trans isomer is more stable than the cis isomer. So the simplest example of this is 2-butene. Cis 2-butene right here, trans 2-butene right here, and you can see space filling models and Lewis structures on the right here as well. The heats of combustion of these two compounds provide evidence of the greater stability of trans alkenes relative to cis alkenes. The combustion of trans to butene is less exothermic than the combustion of cis to butene, indicating that the trans isomer is at a lower energy to begin with than the cis isomer and is thus more stable. The reason the trans isomer is more stable than the cis isomer has to do with steric interactions between these two relatively close groups in the cis isomer. This creates steric strain in the cis isomer that's missing from the trans isomer. And you can imagine for more structurally complex alkenes than just two butene, this same idea still applies because in a cis isomer, we're still gonna have two groups that are relatively close to one another. And we could maybe argue that it's gonna be even worse if I've got, for example, other groups or larger groups attached here relative to these two relatively small methyl groups. So again, the upshot here, trans alkenes are more stable than cis alkenes, all other things being equal. In reactions that are thermodynamically controlled in which the most stable product is the major product, then trans alkenes will be the major product over cis alkenes. We'll see that in a number of cases in an elimination context. We also observe a stability trend in alkenes based on the substitution pattern of the alkene and generally observe that substitution stabilizes alkenes. As we go from monosubstituted to disubstituted to trisubstituted to tetrasubstituted, the alkene gets more stable. And I always find this interesting and a little bit non-intuitive because the tetrasubstituted alkene looks more sterically crowded. It looks like there's some problematic steric interactions between these groups that are relatively close to each other, right? For example, in a tetrasubstituted alkene, we can't avoid a cis relationship between these two pairs of substituents. Nonetheless, tetrasubstituted alkenes are more stable than monosubstituted alkenes, other things being equal. So one thing that we took care to do in looking at this series, for instance, is to ensure that these are all isomers of each other. And this is worth checking on your own. They all have the same number of carbons and one degree of unsaturation. So they're all isomers. 
And we, look at, we can look at heats of combustion, for example, to rationalize and, and support experimentally that the tetra-substituted alkene is the most stable. The explanation for this has to do with the electron donating ability of the alkyl substituents. Each alkyl substituent has, for example, CH bonds associated with it, and those are actually electron donating and donate electron density to these sp2 hybridized carbons involved in the carbon-carbon double bond, creating a stabilizing effect on the double bond. This idea of donating electron density from sigma bonds that are aligned parallel with the p orbitals involved in the pi bonds is known as hyperconjugation, and it's also used to rationalize the greater stability of carbocations with more substituents. A similar effect is happening here, more than likely. There's one other thing I wanted to mention regarding the stability of alkenes, and it concerns alkenes showing up in bridged ring systems and what's known as Brett's rule. Starting generally with alkenes and rings, when a ring has seven atoms or less, the alk and, and contains an alkene, the alkene necessarily has to have the cis geometry since a transalkene in a ring that small would be severely, severely strained. When we get to seven members, and in particular eight, we can actually start fitting a transalkene inside the ring. So here you see, for example, transcyclooctene, which is a surprisingly stable species at room temperature. This is the minimum ring size in which a transalkene can be accommodated. So seven or fewer members, we only have cis alkenes. For example, cyclohexene necessarily has a cis double bond, but we can fit a trans double bond into the eight-membered ring, like you see here. Brett's rule concerns double bonds in bridged ring systems, specifically double bonds at bridge head carbons. And Brett's rule says that double bonds at bridge head carbons cannot exist in rings of seven members or less. So eight-membered ring is okay. We can have a double bond here. Six-membered ring, not a stable compound. Let's unpack this a little bit. First of all, what do we mean by a bridge head double bond? We mean a double bond involving a carbon that is at a bridge head, at a joining point um, on one end or the other of a bridge. So for example here, we have this CH2 group bridging across the six-membered ring in red. We have this bridge head carbon involved in a double bond. That's why it's called a bridge head double bond. Something similar is going on here. It's just here. We have a uh, CH2 group bridging across a what appears to be an eight-membered ring. Yes. And, and so here again, we have a bridge head double bond right here. Brett's rule says that bridge head double bonds cannot exist in rings that have seven members or less. This is not a stable compound, in other words. And the origin of this rule has to do with the fact that in a compound like this, with only a six-membered ring being bridged, that double bond has to have the trans geometry. And we know from above that that's not going to be a happy situation if the ring is seven members or less, seven carbons or less. In essence, what it leads to is a situation where there's actually poor orbital overlap between the two p orbitals that would need to overlap to create the pi bond. At the bridge head, this p orbital is, is actually almost pointed out of the screen to some extent towards you, while this one is, is much more sort of perpendicular to the screen. Let me attempt to draw this. So they're, they're not well aligned, these two p orbitals, for, for pi bonding. This extent of overlap between the p orbitals is relatively weak. This creates a highly unstable pi bond, highly reactive compound. Generally, as a rule, unless you're looking at a relatively large bridge ring system like this, you want to avoid elimination reactions to create bridge head double bonds. This has some interesting effects on regioselectivity, where the double bond ends up in eliminations of alkyl halides containing these bridge ring systems that we may touch on later.